uh, I'm going to jump to the uh, atrial fibrillation presentation. Big chunk of the EP practice has to deal with atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia we see in adults. And with the aging of the population, we're seeing more and more, and has become at least two-thirds of our interventional EP practice, AFib ablations, and not just pulmonary vein isolations, but the uh, treatment, invasive treatment of the arrhythmias that follow after ablation. Um, it's not only important for you guys to know concepts of the pharmacological management, uh, have an idea of what we do when we ablate AFib, um, but also very importantly, how we manage stroke protection in AFib. In, 1998, a group in France took patients with paroxysmal AFib, and they tried to map the first beat that triggered the AFib. And they had catheters in several areas of the heart of the atria. And they found that the vast majority of initiating beats of AFib came from one of the pulmonary veins. So that, that's why this cartoon is kind of beautiful. You get fired into a pulmonary vein, and very quickly it spreads out of there. It gets disorganized. It gets inconsistent activation patterns. And then you get irregular AV nodal conduction. And this is the reason why uh, we have a treatment, an invasive treatment for AFib, uh, by eliminating those uh, foci coming from the pulmonary veins. Next. But it's also a problem from the standpoint of risk of stroke because of <clears throat> the very rapid activations in the atria. If you were to measure atrial uh, heart rate, it's anywhere between 500 and 600 beats per minute. There's no meaningful contraction in most patients. Some patients do retain contractility, but the left atrial appendix becomes an itis for stasis and a clot formation and therefore risk of stroke. Next, the risk of stroke and mortality go, goes up with AFib. And uh, depending on the series you look at, it, mortality may double up to, uh, or may go up to five times. And, and uh, stroke depends on other underlying risk factors for the patient. <clears throat> but it does go up as well with AFib. Also, more recently, a connection between dementia and AFib has been noted, which is, is puzzling because it's not just vascular dementia due to uh, uh, embolic events. Also, Alzheimer's is increased and other non-specific non forms of dementia. We don't know exactly why, but there's a, there's a theory disputing, uh, alluding to the idea that cerebral blood flow is not normal in AFib. Um, and AFib is here to stay with the aging of the population is going to go up. Important that you understand these definitions of AFib, paroxysmal, maybe you can go up, just click the page down button. Um, paroxysmal is AFib that terminates within seven days of onset. As simple as that. Persistent is one that sustains for more than seven days or that you cardiovert. Uh, Long-standing persistent AFib is AFib that has been continuous for one year, okay? Permanent AFib is a term that we use, that the patient and the doctor use to define the treatment expectations. Permanent AFib is an AFib that we have decided that we're not going to treat. That there's nothing specific about AFib itself in that patient, but it's, a, it's an AFib that because of the patient's age or comorbidities, physician and doctor have decided that they're going to let it be, okay? Uh, the goals of treatment are symptom suppression or improving outcomes. Uh, some patients don't have any symptoms with AFib, and you have to be cognizant of that, but we still have to deal with the risk of stroke. We have to prevent tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, awesome, and perhaps prevent dementia, and perhaps reduce the uh, increases in mortality that AFib causes. Two approaches, rhythm control and uh, rate control. Okay, rate control, you've gone over this. This is part of basically uh, internal medicine treatment uh, tr training. Um, Non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, or digoxin are the typical uh, medications we use for rate control. This is part of the initial management. Um, you need to obviously um, <clears throat> make sure that the patient does not have an accessory pathway because if you slow down conduction through the AV node, um, you increase the chances of pre-excitation. You have to understand when you have an accessory pathway on the AV node, it's a matter of competition between those two. You will get a wider QRS when, when the accessory pathway wins. You'll get a narrower QRS when the AV node wins. Um, if you uh, slow the AV node, you may increase the chances of conduction through the um, accessory pathway. 
Um, not much more about this. Uh, let's go to the next. So cardioversion, obviously, this is something that you do in certain situations of uh, increasing symptoms. Patient is in uh, pulmonary edema. Or <clears throat> patient is uh, under, hypotensive, so under situations of emergency, you cardiovert. But also, uh, out, of, out of those emergencies, you need to uh, consider cardioversion for certain situations. Certain situations, um, the patient shows up uh, with several weeks of symptoms. It's very reasonable, and they show up in AFib. It's very reasonable to cardiovert, but you need to, you need to realize that uh, the patient may have an increased risk of stroke. Pa most patients have not been anticoagulated, so if you're going to shock someone, you're going to restore normal rhythm, and now you take responsibility for what happens afterwards. So you need to make sure you have appropriate stroke protection. Uh, if the patient has not been anticoagulated, um, you, and they have been in AFib for more than 48 hours, you need to uh, anticoagulate, do a TE, and assess the left atrial appendix to make sure there's no thrombus there, <clears throat> and then you can safely cardiovert. And you need to anticoagulate for at least uh, four weeks, three to four weeks, regardless of the CHATSVAS score. Um, simple concept there. When you shock someone, you're taking responsibility for what happens afterwards. If a patient is going in and out of AFib, there's nothing you can do about it. But when you restore normal rhythm, what happens after is your, is your responsibility. And there is atrial stunning, and there is the continuing uh, decreased contractility in the appendage, even after restoration of normal standard rhythm. Those are things you need to understand. Next. So rhythm control, antiarrhythmics. You've heard the theory before. Um, in AFib, they are useful. They are useful, but they're seldom a solution. And the use has to be done in a very rational way because they can be unsafe. So you need to divide patients as to whether they have structural heart disease or no structural heart disease. Why is that? Because in the presence of structural heart disease, these medications can kill. It's not that they are you know, problematic. These medications can kill. Um, uh, class one drugs have been shown to increase mortality more than placebo uh, in patients with structural heart disease, so you cannot use them. The only ones you can use are the ferrolite, dronedarone, or sotolol. Um, in the context of coronary artery disease, those three. In the context of heart failure, only amiodarone and the ferrolite have been <coughs> shown to be safe. Uh, when you don't have structural heart disease, basically all drugs are, can be used. But again, uh, and amiodarone is second line drug because of its side effects uh, uh, long term. Catheter ablation, as you can see, is applicable to all settings, uh, whether you have structural disease or, or not. Ablation is a solution uh, for rhythm control. Next. Uh, okay, so how do we ablate uh, atrial fibrillation? There's a bunch of different strategies. I mentioned earlier this concept of the first beat that triggers AFib as coming from the pulmonary veins. This is what led to focus in the pulmonary veins. But you have to understand, patients with persistent AFib, you know, you may have had AFib for 10 years, ongoing for 10 years. Who cares about the first beat 10 years ago that came from the pulmonary veins? There's got to be something else. This illustrates our lack of understanding of the mechanisms of AFib. But whether we understand it or not, what has been shown is that through different strategies, ablation in the pulmonary vein region, aiming at disconnection, electrical disconnection of the pulmonary vein. You want to show that electricity here is dissociated from electricity in the rest of the atrium. <clears throat> and when you do that, whether you just do two circles around the pulmonary vein antra, or um, this doesn't work, like this to create a, a wide isolation area, taking each pulmonary vein pair at once, alone or combined with other lesions, um, or in a more patchy way. The idea here is when you destroy tissue there, <clears throat> it seems to work. But not to be uh, cynical, we have a uh, next slide, please. We have a bunch of different strategies that um, have become a little bit more uniform in the past, uh, I would say, 10 years or so. Uh, but the idea is that the left atrium, particularly the posterior wall of the left, of the left atrium, is where uh, the money is for AFib. How well does it do? Next, please. Go to the next one. Oh, we're making progress. Um, so as far as symptoms, AFib, does, AFib ablation does a great job. If you compare it with, with antiarrhythmics, um, 
this is a, a randomized study comparing the thermocool aether ablation catheter uh, with uh, antidemic drugs, much better than, than any drug we have. Is it perfect? No, we have a success rate anyway in the high 70% over, over nine months, over one or two years it gets a little bit less, but um, nevertheless, uh, next please. Or maybe not, all right. Nevertheless, um, it seems to work. And it has been tested even as a first line of therapy before even trying any antiarrhythmic drug. Uh, this is a bit controversial, and I, I'm not an advocate of AFib ablation as a first line of therapy for paroxysmal AFib, because when the patient seeks treatment for AFib, it's very rare that they come and tell you, <coughs> uh, I just had AFib, one AFib episode. And, um, or, or the other, there are two extremes. Patients may have as, you know, I had palpitations, I went to the ER, this is my EKG, I was in AFib, two hours later I was in sinus, what do I do now, doctor? That's one extreme, and the other extreme is patients that have had symptoms for many years, <clears throat> they, they may occur uh, two, three times per month, they may last 20 minutes or so, and they've been going, living with that for many years. So in the second scenario, you may tell them, listen, we could try a drug, we could try ablation, but you already have a track record of that AFib, and the patient knows how much that AFib impacts their quality of life. In the, second, in the first case, the patient has had one episode of AFib that was paroxysmal and subsided. I don't advocate AFib ablation in that patient because AFib ablation is a, it's an invasive procedure with real risks. And if you just have one or two uh, episodes. I like to, to have a patient experience what life is with AFib for a few weeks, months, and then decide. Because if you, if you have one episode of a few minutes every six months, I will tell you, just put up with it. You have to make an assessment of the risk of stroke. Um, but as far as uh, rhythm management treatments, I would not recommend ablation. But <clears throat> these three papers look at the efficacy of AFib ablation as a first line, and it seems to um, do the trick better than drugs. Next, please. So, um, if you haven't had any prior antiremic treatment, of course, a AFib ablation does better um, in three different studies. If you have had prior antiremic treatment and you still have symptoms, then there's no point in changing to, an, to going, going through the entire list of antiarrhythmics. If you have failed an antiarrhythmic, then ablation is the way to go, and it, the differences are much greater. So, if you look at um, ablation versus drugs as a first line, sure, ablation is better, and the, you can see how the numbers are incredibly different, uh, but in all three comparisons, ablation did better than drugs <coughs> in patients that have not had a previous treatment. But you can see how drugs did reasonably well, okay? If you have failed a drug, then the chances of another drug working is either between seven and 19% and ablation does that much better. Okay, next. Um, so in my book, as a first-line therapy, symptom control can be achieved in a substantial uh, fraction of patients with drug therapy, and uh, there's no need to jump to ablation. Next. Um, and ablation comes at a risk of complications, <coughs> pericardial bleeding and tamponade about 1% typically. We just uh, deal with this with pericardiosynthesis. We have to abort the procedure and, and manage the patient appropriately with uh, cell saver and autotransfusion. And typically, uh, you don't need to go to surgery. Risk of stroke, it's quoted between one in 100, one in 200. It's probably a lot less with more aggressive uh, heparin treatment during the ablation. The most fear uh, complication is atriosophageal fistula which is quoted between one in 2,000, one in 4,000. Um, when it happens, it has a 50% mortality, and morbidity is much worse. It's potentially lethal, basically, <clears throat> when you've damaged the posterior wall of the left atrium, and that has led to damage of the adventitia of the esophagus. Typically, three or four weeks later, the patient comes with fever, chills, symptoms of endocarditis, sometimes neurological symptoms from uh, septic emboli in the brain, and... Um, if they survive that, then you have to do surgery and repair the esophagus. It's a mess, so you don't want to deal with that. Uh, we have temperature sensors in the esophagus to prevent that. And then there are other kind of collateral damage complications, phrenic nerve paralysis. Sometimes you can, you can ablate close to the 
uh, right phrenic nerve when you ablate the right superior pulmonary vein. Pulmonary vein stenosis is a complication perhaps of the past uh, with the current ablation techniques being focused more in the, right, in the left atrium body, not in the mostium of the pulmonary veins. Vascular access and death is, are, is listed there. Next. Does ablation prevent strokes? That has not been tested yet. Cabana trial uh, was specifically designed to test that and results were, were reported but not published yet, so I cannot tell you details. Some observational studies have suggested that when ablation works, as far as the risk of stroke, it's as good as never having a FIP. It's as good as sinus rhythm when it works. Uh, next. This is a long, uh, large series from Utah where they look at ablation, AFib without ablation, or no AFib. It's a very complex uh, uh, graph looking at different populations, patients with uh, different risk factors for stroke. The bottom line is for every, every, every category of risk of a for stroke, um, we had improvement with ablation. So it seems to do the trick as far as all the benefits of restoring normal sinus rhythm. Next. Um, even mortality has been shown to be better after ablation compared to um, uh, no ablation. Again, these are observational series. We're waiting, up, we're waiting on Cabana, which is the largest study looking at this that has not been published yet. Next. Um, so when is, when is safe ablation appropriate? A simple thing like every, every, every other medical condition you need to individualize. AFib is very heterogeneous in, in, as far as the symptoms, as far as the AFib burden, as far as the presence of structural heart disease, and as far as the prognostic impact. As I will explain later, we use the chats vas scoring system to assess the risk of stroke, but not everybody has equal implications from AFib. There are patients that you may just tell them, put up with it. If you have uh, five minutes of symptoms once every six months, just let it be, and we'll deal with it when it becomes an issue, because in that kind of stage, the, ablation, the treatment we have is worse than the disease. Um, but that's obviously not uniform. Uh, there's heterogeneity as far as the antiarrhythmic drug choice, as I explained, and the, their success, depending on whether they have structural disease, whether if it is paroxysmal or persistent. Of course, there are issues with compliance long term. Antiarrhythmic drugs never solve the problem, they just help you control it. And ablation success is very different in different, different scenarios, paroxysmal versus persistent structural disease, and the risks are different as well.